Uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, and welcome to this afternoon. Can I can I just um, can I just acknowledge the two partners in this presentation for, if you like, the courage to bring people together and start talking about this stuff. We need to do more of it, and as you've heard from um, some of the folk, there's an awful lot of mystique in this uh, business, an awful lot of terminology which often doesn't make sense, and and we need to all get our heads around it. And we'll talk a bit more about what Mr. Williamson actually didn't say um, as we get to the end of this pro uh, end of the session. So look, I'm I'm a practical person. Um, I'm not an engineer, and I don't have any particular qualifications, but I know how to do stuff. And so what I'm going to talk to you about is actually what we're doing as Wellington City Council in the market to actually talk about and communicate with people around earthquake risk for the city and so we need to have some context and I've borrowed this context from uh, my colleagues in GNS Science and I need to say that otherwise I'll be accused of plagiarism uh, but that we are partners with GNS along with uh, uh, Regional Council, the Natural Hazards Platform and EQC on a program called It's Our Fault. And it's our fault is a piece of work that we've been doing for nearly four years, analysing the fault lines that run around and through Wellington to try and get a handle on, so what is the risk? How, how big is this? And this is actually the setting. So the North Island sits on effectively the Australian plates, so Nick, we do have a link. We are actually de facto Aussies. And, 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 but under, the key point here is under, uh, just off the coast out from Wire Rapper, that there is uh, the Pacific Plate that kind of links with the Australian Plate and it runs under each other. A bit like a spring, I suppose. And, and one of the issues that GNS has identified is that under normal circumstances, if there was ever normal in the earthquake world, then these two plates would move only a few centimetres every year and we wouldn't normally feel or see them move but right now they're locked. And the intersection of those two plates that runs more or less down the centre of Cook Strait is called the subduction zone and one of the big areas of risk for us is if there is movement and there is a breakage um, in the subduction zone. But the three faults that we actually worry about are these three. So the Ahario fault runs on the other side of town out of Cook Strait, it actually runs out of Cook Strait and you'll see a bit of that in a second, right up Ahario Valley, kind of past Porua, heads off into the centre of the North Island. The one we really worry about is the Wellington fault, again starts on the edge of the subduction zone, uh, kind of runs up through Thorndon, along the side of the harbour where the road and the railway uh, happen to be, in case you didn't know, and then ducks up through Hutt Valley, hope you get home tonight. Um, and, and of course the vulnerability for Wellington is that our water comes from kind of the very north of the Hutt Valley and the blasted pipeline that feeds us crosses the fault line five times. And then, of course, we've got the Wire Rapper Fault, which is on the other side of the hills, but we haven't heard too much from that fault since 1855 when Lower Hutt effectively rose out of the harbour and the airport is now where it is. So those are the, that's the, the kind of magnitude in which we're, we're thinking about these things, and we haven't had any activity in any of those areas uh, for many years. So all those lines that are on those maps represent faults that have occurred from time to time over who knows how long, a long, long time. And so, as one of the other speakers said, we are surrounded by faults, whether we like it or not, and we are in an earthquake-prone territory, and that has some relevance for the strength of our buildings. And of course, you're asking, just as we're asking, when is the big one due? And more, and more recently was the one we had on the 21st of July, the big one. And the answer to that from the experts is, no it wasn't, but it was close in some respects. And we're probably lucky that it wasn't closer. Um, 
and one of you, can't remember which one, uh, said the consequences of having it closer would have been much different. So what we've actually dedu deducted out of the It's Our Fault, uh, and you won't be able to read that that well, no. Um, what we've deducted out of the It's Our Fault work is actually even since the 21st of July, the risk of a, of a blowout from the Wellington Fault has reduced over time by about 20%. So what that means is that our likelihood of anything happening with the Wellington Fault from now onwards is probably 1 in 260, and it could be longer. So it's okay. We're all safe, because it'll all outsee us, and someone else will have to pick up the pieces. But, and I guess the message clearly is, while we joke about this stuff, because it is a pretty serious topic, actually we can't be complacent, and you saw that from the map, and the 21st of July is what I describe as a practice. We actually can't forget that this stuff is around us. So one of the things in the building trade that we talk about related to earthquakes is, is ground shaking. And this map uh, also is a GNS map, and what it attempts to do is identify uh, the various levels of ground shaking that may occur in an earthquake. And if you look in particular to the, to the bright orange, uh, no, it won't work up there. So the bright orange uh, kind of line that starts down in the Haast, goes up the west coast, crosses over the main divide, heads in through Hamna. Ever wondered why there's hot springs at Hamra? There you go. Uh, heads towards Wellington, Seddon even. <laughs> Interesting, eh? Then disappears into Cook Strait. So that is the area that's identified that is, uh, it's also partly the Alpine Fault, but it's the area identified that is likely to cause the most ground shaking of any earthquake. And it's probably no surprise that we've known this stuff for a number of years. And of consequence, the building code takes all of this into account. You know, it knows that our colleagues in Auckland who are down at the purple end of the range have no earthquake risk at all. Kind of puts aside the fact they're sitting on, earth, on uh, vol volcanoes, but for, as an, an earthquake sense, they don't have an earthquake risk. But in places like Haast Pass and down in Fiordland, if you're ever uh, building down there, then there's a high propensity of uh, shaking. Now, those elements are reflected in the design standards in the building code. So what that means is hidden away in the calculations, and Kit d doesn't understand 34%, so he probably doesn't own, understand the design codes in the building act, but I jest. Um, what, it, what it means is, is something like this. So we know, because of the seismic risk in Wellington, that the building code takes that into account, and as at today, subject to any other changes that might occur, a like-for-like -like building, Auckland versus Wellington, our building will be three times stronger, and it'll be a third stronger than a like building in Christchurch. That's not always been the case. The seismic hazard factor, the Z factor for those in the trade, has been adjusted for Christchurch as a consequence of the earthquake. And the key point here is that it doesn't necessarily mean that it means Wellington buildings cost more, it just means they're built stronger. And it's all the stuff you don't see. You know, it could be the, the size of the laminate beam in this building that's bigger here than potentially in Auckland. So resilience for Wellington's been an ongoing thing, many years, 32 years, in fact we have been doing work around strengthening. And because we have a city-wide mandate, we have to worry about road tunnels and, and traffic tunnels, we have to worry about pipes, we have to worry about bridges, over bridges, as well as houses and buildings, and so on. And we're a building owner in our own right. We have 683 buildings of various sizes uh, scattered 
across the city, and we can't do, and we've never pretended to do all this stuff um, ourselves. And so one example of a partnership is one we're doing with HPT, in fact. Um, in our Cuba Street precinct, so that's, uh, that's unreinforced masonry territory, if ever there was one, um, and we're doing some work with Victoria University to see if we can build, if you like, or design a strengthening solution that might see a number of buildings bonded together, tied together, bolted together, however you call it, so that the mass will produce enough residual value in the buildings uh, to comply with the code and make them strong. And, and in addition, we've done, because we are one of the most progressive local authorities in New Zealand, we've given a lot of advice uh, to the government about the policy that was announced yesterday and is why I referred to the fact that there's a lot of things not said yet. Equally, since 2006, we've had a, po a proactive policy of strengthening, uh, of assessing at least buildings in our wider city. So we, we said, councillors said at the time, we want to find out about the strength of our city so we know what to prepare for. And so we've been assessing since early 2009, actually, uh, buildings across the city that were built pre-1976, two, uh, two storeys or more, and three or more residential units. And so as at 30 June, that's where we're at. And as a consequence of that, there are 611, 134 of those are heritage listed buildings, buildings across the city who are deemed to be earthquake prone, or as you've heard already, uh, do not comply with 33% of the building code. And we're continuing to do that. We'll finish uh, in about April next year. So uh, that'll be 5,000-ish buildings across the city assessed. Building owners know where they are at, um, and they'll also know what their responsibilities are under the Building Act. But we haven't forgot homes either. Because one of the things I learned in Christchurch, having been born there and still have family there, um, was the untalked about, I think, uh, damage that's occurred residentially in some of those areas. And uh, one of the things that led us to develop this book in conjunction with brands was a visit I made uh, to actually shift my brother-in-law. And the house next door was your typical brick and tile house, three bedrooms, um, standalone garage, all the normal things that you would expect. The bricks had fallen off, for sure, but the house had been shunted off its foundations by 1.4 metres. That's about that. And it started me to think, well, that could easily happen in Wellington, and so we ought to learn from this and see what we could do. When the engineers uh, for the insurance company went underneath the house, they found that it was built quite typically in the 60s. Um, it had a, uh, a wooden pile um, system with, of course, your standard four by four bearers, four by three bearers on which the flooring system sat. And quite rightly at the time, the bearers were wired down to the piles with wire. But what happened, what appears to have happened, and what certainly the engineer's conclusion was, for whatever reason, the builder decided that it wouldn't be galvanised wire. And so it's probably no surprise then that the wire had rusted through, and so it was only sitting on the foundations or on its piles by the grace of God. And so it got a shunt. And that's what will happen here. <coughs> so we then said, OK, well, we'll write the book, which is great, it's a home handyman's guide. Um, but at the same time, we'll call in uh, the folk from Master Builders Federation and certified builders, and we'll get them to do some home, ins home assessments, which they're doing. $160 a throw and seven point checklist, including piles. Um, we've done several hundred. It's now a region wide initiative, and we're doing about 50 a day. And guess what the most I suppose issues we're finding with houses in Wellington. Yep, piles. 
and the repiling uh, contractors are saying they've never been busier. <laughs> and since Sunday, uh, the 21st of July, funnily enough, EQC now want to partner with us and extend this program nationwide. We haven't forgot um, probably the mum and dad investors, because most of you, I would expect are what I describe in the reasonably well-informed building owner, but there's a lot who aren't, and there's a lot who don't understand what their responsibilities are. So this book's available also. You can get it, see it on the website. Both those are in PDFs, and you can read them, print them off, do what you want. But if you want some hard copies, please let me know. Happy to send you a, a, a box full. This is for the uninformed commercial building owner. So he knows what to look for and what his responsibilities are. But for heritage buildings, um, of which we have a number, 835 on our district plan that are listed heritage buildings, and we provide some assistant programs, this is one of them, uh, for heritage building owners to get some funding to get them started on the strengthening process. So we say to them, don't be afraid of the fact that you have a heritage building because we can give you some money, and generally we would give 40 to 60,000, generally, um, but more in special cases, to heritage building owners to get things like a building, a uh, engineering assessment done, so a detailed engineering assessment, people then know where they stand, and we'll also give them another tranche for actually uh, doing some of the strengthening, and there's some, we, um, we had a spe specific program about six years ago in Allen and Blair, Blair Street. All of those people used uh, the Build Heritage Fund, and of course they're no longer earthquake prone. And then of course we do a lot of work in trying to understand what the solutions are. Uh, this, of course, is a photo of the town hall, and we're about to close that building uh, for a three-year strengthening program where it will eventually sit on base isolation. But actually, there's a whole range of new uh, tools and methodology, and Kit talked about two or three of those that are coming through. Uh, we've even got a paint manufacturer who's in, um, um, in test mode now with a paint that can be used on run reinforcing masonry to strengthen it and um, hopefully save a lot of hassle. We'll see where those tests go. So uh, you've heard a bit about the announcement of yesterday and I'm not going to repeat that, but I think what's worth clarifying is, is this. Firstly, the Dom Post hasn't got it right. You know, the 20 year headline is misinformation. It is still 15 years, and as I said to uh, Mr. Williamson yesterday, oh, you bugger, you've copied us. Because our program is 15 years. And what's added on, of course, is this five year period to, uh, for local authorities to assess uh, buildings. Uh, we'll do that reasonably easily. We've got 2,800 buildings that haven't been assessed outside of the 700 we've got to catch up on, and we'll do that in a couple of years. Um, what he didn't talk about was the issue of if you get a building assessed and it's got a critical structural weakness, so it'll be an area of the building that may fail in severe shaking, then the timeline will be much less to get that dealt to. Uh, and we're going to be given powers, uh, the local authorities will be given powers under the Building Act to act if that's not done. Um, not widely amplified are any buildings that have, that have been assessed and, have, and are earthquake prone buildings, their timelines don't change. A number of calls, even uh, messages today saying, oh, so does that mean I get uh, 20 years from today? Well, actually, no. If you've got a date, that's the date, and the clock's ticking. Uh, the public register is interesting. Uh, not news to us, because all of our earthquake prone buildings are on our website anyway, but not every local authority does that. And I think it's fundamentally important for people to know what buildings are earthquake prone and make their own decision about whether they go into the building. 
And of course, we can't forget that just because a building's earthquake prone, it, is not, it does not necessarily mean that it's unsafe to work in. Doesn't mean the building's safe, however, because no, actually, whether we like it or not, no building's safe, because we don't know the intensity of any earthquake wherever it is. So for me, the learnings, I think, are, in, uh, are simply some of these. Um, keep it in perspective. Um, I wouldn't want any of you to leave, away, uh, leave here today and be threatened or panicked or frightened about what's ahead of us. Because for the most part, we've known about it, and it's a matter of managing it sensibly. And Don, I think, was, uh, raised several good points in his, question, in his presentation about taking the risk in perspective. Um, and, you know, those are some stats around the number of road deaths. We don't seem to worry too much and get stressed about the number of road deaths we have in New Zealand or indeed Australia. But there is a degree of panic, I think, emerging about the earthquake risk. I'm saying put it in perspective. And don't forget to be prepared. Um, I had a discussion with a government department before I came here about a building that's actually not far from here where they've just had an engineering report, it's under 20% and it's got critical structural weaknesses. And they were actually asking me, should we keep it open? Uh, I would have thought that the answer was pretty evident with critical structural weaknesses. And as I say to everyone I speak to, and I, uh, you've probably gathered I do quite a bit of this, um, share your risks. And, and in this forum, I guess, it also, you need to be talking about your neighbours on either side of your properties. Because if anything does happen, you're likely uh, to need them. And of course, we actually don't want to get into this position. This is what I would desc describe as uh, my version of overreaction. Thank you very much.